I'm Jimmy Floyd. Welcome to TED Talks in NYC, the series that brings TED.com celebrated conversations to television and keeps the conversation going with some of the brightest minds in New York City. This week's show is all about oysters. Landscape architect Kate Orff wants to put them to work in our city. That's right, you heard it, put them to work. But what does that mean? And is it a good idea or a bad one? Here she is in her TED Women Conference talk from 2010, Reviving New York's Rivers, with oysters. I am passionate about the American landscape and how the physical form of the land from the great Central Valley of California to the bedrock of Manhattan has really shaped our history and our character. But one thing is clear, in the last 100 years alone, our country, and this is a, a sprawl map of America, our country has systematically sort of flattened and homogenized the landscape to the point where we've forgotten uh, our relationship with the plants and animals that live alongside us and the dirt beneath our feet. And so how I see my work contributing is sort of trying to like literally reimagine these connections and physically rebuild them. This graph represents you know, what we're dealing with now in the built environment. And it's really kind of a conflux of urban population rising, biodiversity plummeting, and also, um, of course, sea levels rising and climate changing. So when I also think about design, I think about trying to um, rework and re-engage the sort of lines on these graph on this graph in a, in, a, in a more productive way and you can see from the arrow here indicating you are here I'm trying to really sort of blend and meld these two very divergent fields of urbanism and ecology and sort of bring them together in an exciting new way so the era of big infrastructure is over I mean these sort of top-down, monofunctional, capital-intensive solutions are really not going to cut it. We need new tools and new approaches. Similarly, the idea of architecture as this sort of object in the field devoid of context is really not the, excuse me, <laughs> it's fairly blatant, is, is really <laughs> not the sort of approach that we need to take. So we need new stories, new heroes, um, and, and new tools. So now I want to introduce you to my new hero in the sort of global climate change war, and that is the Eastern Oyster. So albeit a very small creature and very modest, this creature is incredible because it can agglomerate into these kind of mega reef structures. It can grow, you can grow it, and, and did I mention it's quite tasty. So the oyster was the basis for a kind of a manifesto-like urban design project that I did about the New York Harbor called Oyster Texture. And sort of the core idea of oyster texture is to harness the biological power of mussels, eelgrass, and oysters, species that live in the harbor, and at the same time sort of harness the, the power of people um, who live in the community um, towards making change now. Here's a map of my city, New York City, with showing inundation in red. And what's circled is the site that I'm going to talk about, the Gowanus Canal and Governor's Island. If you look here at this map, showing everything in blue is sort of out in the water, and everything in yellow is upland. But you can see, even just like intuit from this map, that the harbor has sort of been dredged and flattened um, and went from a rich three-dimensional mosaic to kind of flat muck in really a matter of years. Another set of views of actually the Gowanus Canal itself. Now, the Gowanus is particularly smelly. I will admit it. There are problems of sewage overflow and contamination, but I would also argue that almost every city uh, has this exact uh, condition, and it's a condition that we're all facing. And here's a map of that condition showing the contaminants in yellow and green, exacerbated by this new flow of storm surge and sea level rise. So we really had a lot to deal with. <laughs> 
When we started this project, one of the core ideas was to look back in history and try to understand you know, what was there. And you can see from this map, there's this incredible geographical signature of a kind of a series of islands that were out in the harbor and a matrix of salt marshes and beaches that served as sort of natural wave attenuation for the upland settlement. We also learned at this time that you could actually eat an oyster about the size of a dinner plate in the Gowanus Canal itself. So our concept is really this kind of back to the future concept, harnessing the intelligence of that land settlement pattern. And the idea has two sort of core stages. One is to develop a new kind of artificial ecology, a reef out in the harbor that would then protect new settlement patterns inland in the Gowanus. Because if you have cleaner water and slower water, you can imagine a new way of living with that water. So the project really addresses these three core issues in kind of a new and exciting way, I think. Here we are, back to our hero, the oyster. And again, it's this incredibly exciting animal. It accepts algae and detritus in one end, and then through this kind of beautiful, glamorous set of stomach organs, out the other end comes cleaner water. And one oyster can filter up to 50 gallons of water a day. Oyster reefs also covered about a quarter of our harbor and were capable of filtering water in the harbor in a matter of days. They were key in our culture and our economy. Basically, New York was built on the backs of oystermen, and our streets were literally built over oyster shells. This image is an image of an oyster cart, which is now as ubiquitous as the hot dog cart is today. So again, we got the short end of the deal there. <laughs> Finally, oysters can attenuate and agglomerate onto each other and form these amazing natural reef structures. They really become nature's wave attenuators and they become the sort of bedrock of any harbor ecosystem. Many, many species depend on them. So we were inspired by the oyster, but I was also inspired by the life cycle of the oyster. It can move from a sort of a fertilized egg to a spat, which is when they're floating through the water and when they're ready to attach on to another oyster, to um, an adult male oyster or female oyster in a number of weeks. We reinterpreted this life cycle on the scale of our site and kind of took the Gowanus as sort of a giant oyster nursery, where oysters would be grown up in the Gowanus, then paraded down in their spat stage and seeded out on the Bay Ridge Reef. And so the kind of core idea here was to kind of hit the reset button and kind of regenerate an ecology over time that was regenerative and cleaning and productive. How does the reef work? Well, it's very, very simple. A kind of core concept here is that climate change isn't uh, something that will like the answers won't land down from the moon, uh, and with a $20 billion price tag, we should simply start and get to work with what we have now and what's in front of us. So this image is simply showing it's a field of marine piles um, interconnected with this woven fuzzy rope. What is fuzzy rope, you ask? It's just that. It's this very inexpensive thing available practically at your hardware store, and it's very cheap. So we imagine that we would actually potentially even host a bake sale to start our new project. <laughs> so in the studio, rather than drawing, we began to learn how to knit. The concept was to really knit this rope together and sort of develop this new soft infrastructure for the oysters to grow on. And you can see in this diagram how it grows over time from a sort of an infrastructural space into a sort of a new public urban space. And that grows over time dynamically with the threat of climate change. It also creates this incredibly interesting, I think, new amphibious public space where you can imagine working, you can imagine a sort of recreating in a new way. In the end, what we realized we were making was actually a new sort of blue-green watery park for the next watery century, an amphibious park, if you will. So get your Tevas on. So you can imagine scuba diving here. This is an image of high school students, scuba divers that we worked with on our team. You can imagine all sort of new kind of manner of living with a new relationship with the water and also kind of a hybridizing of recreational and science programs in terms of monitoring. Another new vocabulary word for the brave new world, this is the word flepsy. It's a short for a floating upwelling system. And this glorious, very readily available device is basically a floating raft with an oyster nursery below. So the water is churned through this raft. You can see the eight chambers on the side host little baby oysters and essentially force feed them. So rather than having like 10 oysters, you have 10,000 oysters. And then those spat are then seeded 
Here's the Gowanus future with the oyster rafts on the shorelines. The flepsification of the Gowanus, new word, and also showing oyster gardening and for the community along its edges. And finally, how much fun it would be to watch the Flepsy Parade and cheer on the oyster spats as they go down <laughs> to the reef. I get asked two questions about this project. One is, why is it happening now? And the second one is, when can we eat the oysters? And the answer is, not yet. They're working. But we imagine with our calculations that uh, by 2050, you might be able to sink your teeth into a Gowanus oyster. To conclude, this is just one cross-section of one piece of city, but my dream is, my hope is, that when you sort of all go back to your own cities, that we can start to work together and collaborate on sort of remaking and reforming uh, a new urban landscape towards a more sustainable, uh, a more livable, and a more delicious future. Thank you. <laughs>Dig right in with me, Mark Kurlansky, journalist and author of The Big Oyster, History on the Half Shell. Pete Malinowski, the aquaculture teacher at the New York Harbor School, which runs an oyster growing program, and we're going to talk all about that. And Dave Pasternak, he of course is the chef of the New York restaurant Esca, and I should mention, Dave, that you are a fisherman, and we're going to talk about that as well. Welcome to all of you. So I want to start first with you, Mark Kurlansky, because I want to get the broad sense of the history of oysters in New York City and, and what's happened to them. Oysters uh, used to be iconic for New York. If you thought of New York, you thought of oysters. They were sold on every street corner. They were sold all night. They had, you know, the Fulton Fish Market was the last of a whole series of downtown open air food markets, and they used to be open all night before there were bridges to Brooklyn because the ferries ran all night. And uh, it was a fashion to go in the middle of the night um, downtown and have an oyster stew or some oysters on the half shell. And, and now the fish market has moved. The fish market's moved. All, all the those, there's no more are... of those markets. And well, what happened to the oysters was that uh, there was a, a long history in New York of epidemics, cholera, typhoid, and they didn't know why because they didn't understand germs and what caused diseases. But after uh, Pasteur and then Robert Koch, the German uh, biologist, they, they started to understand what caused them and, they, and how to trace their causes. And every time there was an ep epidemic, it would be traced to one oyster bed or another. There were oyster beds everywhere in New York, in the East River and off of uh, Brooklyn and uh, in the harbor and everywhere. And uh, um, one after another was closed down because uh, of diseases. You know, it, it, it came as a big shock to people to realize that dumping raw sewage on a food supply turns out to be unhealthy. But what about the oyster's ability to, as she describes it, uh, take in algae and even detritus and filter it out to make cleaner water. Yeah, this is very this is very misunderstood. You know, oysters clean water in the sense that they clarify natural things like algae so that, you know, when Henry Hudson first sailed into New York Harbor, you could probably see to the bottom because there were so many oysters. It makes the water really clear. But it, it doesn't remove, uh, uh, it doesn't remove bacteria, it doesn't remove um, PCBs or heavy metals. So, so Pete Malinowski, how about Kate Orff's proposal? I mean, is it a good one considering what oysters can and really, in fact, cannot do? Well, I think given that the largest pollution source in New York Harbor is nitrogen waste from people, that's treated sewage that gets pumped into the water, that's where you get your algae blooms. Right. So um, oysters can, you know, do have the ability to remove the algae that comes as a result of all that nitrogen waste getting pushed into the pushed into the rivers. So in that sense, it is dealing with a anthrogenic waste that's going into the water. But I agree with Mark on the heavy metals. They incorporate those into our into their bodies, but unless we remove them from the system, the heavy metal the PCBs aren't removed from the system. So we would have to do it in a very directed and targeted way, as yeah. As in Kate fact, you're, you're you're actually getting a heavy dose of these things if you eat an oyster. Aha. Uh -huh. um, yeah, you're well, intake them. Well, I want to come to you on that then. Uh, a lot of people love oysters. Very popular. Uh, so how do we go about uh, 
eating them in a safe way, and then I want to look ahead to the future. But let's talk about the oysters we eat now. Where are they coming from? The oysters we Chef. eat na now coming from, you could buy them from pretty much anywhere. Uh, myself, I would only eat an oyster from north of Long Island. I don't eat any oysters south of Long Island. Do you catch your own? I've been eating a lot of oysters out of the Great South Bay recently, which they've really cleaned up and they've done a tremendous job with the quality of the water. And it's very state regulated. I mean, they have to test the water all the time. You know, they, they test the oysters. So, I mean, I have no problem with it. Have you had an opportunity to observe water quality in and around New York City? Uh, and whether or not there's been a change, say, in the last 20 years, as a chef and as a fisherman, not yeah. obviously as a scientist, but as someone who might consider fishing in our waters. Go to Jamaica Bay. You know, five years ago, Jamaica Bay, the water was, you know, uninhabitable. Go there now at this present moment, and there's a tremendous bird life, there's bait fish, the, the clarity of the water's tr changed dramatically. You know, they added a lot of sewers to in and around the area, so there's not so much runoff of raw waste going into it. Uh, you know, they've tightened the regulations. Uh, all the bulkheads they build now are f with uh, new kinds of metals and woods that aren't treated with creosol, so on and so on. What would be the benefit, you know, for a chef uh, at ESCO or anywhere else? It's your backyard. To being able to your backyard. There's nothing better than eating, you know, we all preach eat local. Mm -hmm. This is as local as you can get, you know? Wouldn't it be great if you could go back to the days, uh, you know, this used to be what New York was, you know, where, where you, you, you'd go into a restaurant like yours and you'd have, you know, a variety of oysters because they grow differently in different parts of New York City, you know, and you could get the, you know, the Saddle Rock oysters or you could get Brooklyn oysters or you could get Staten Island oysters. Uh, uh, and, you know, you would have this wonderful sense of being in New York and eating local food. Again, being in yeah. New York again. Is it feasible? Well, it's, it's, it's feasible if they clean up the heavy metals and PCBs, which is a whole big debate about how that gets done. And, Pete, you believe, I, I know, in the healing powers of oysters, especially the oyster population in the harbor, uh, for the harbor, which is a lot of what Kate uh, is talking about. Say a little bit about what you mean. We grow oysters at Harbor School to restore oyster reefs to New York Harbor for the ecosystem services they provide. So oyster reefs, like Kate mentioned in the piece, uh, provide three-dimensional structure, provide nursery and habitat for a variety of invertebrates and fish. Historically, there's over 75 species of fish that either reproduced, hid, or ate in New York Harbor oyster reefs. So that all those services are gone. New York Harbor was once most, one of the more, most bioproductive areas of the world, right? We live in an estuary. Estuaries are the most productive. It still is very productive. It yeah. still is. That's the amazing thing. And, th and that's why there were so many oysters, because estuaries are the ideal situation for oysters, which live in brackish water. And, you know, the Hudson River it just had, a, you know, which is partly salt and partly fresh. I mean, there's just tremendous biodiversity. There, there still is, but not nearly. Even, like even today, was. a fifth of the striped bass in the Western Atlantic come out of the Hudson River. Absolutely. Every year, they come in and they can reproduce. And it, it, even in its beleaguered state, it's still able to produce all those striped bass. Imagine what it could if we could res restore those oyster reefs back and get it back to the biodiversity that it once was. Now, the Harbor School is not just theoretical, right? The kids get hands-on uh, experience. Can you say a little more about the Harbor School? Yeah, the Harbor School is a New York City public high school located on Governor's Island. We have six career and tech ed programs of study. So we teach our students to scuba dive, grow oysters and fish, drive boats, build boats, repair boats, and um, it's all hands-on. And the Oyster Project provides a median for connecting all those different programs of study. So we rely on our boat driving students to get us to the reef, our scuba diving students to bring oysters up to monitor, our aquaculture students to grow the oysters and do the scientific monitoring. And it's a way to take education out of the classroom and away from a simple project into something that's meaningful and has long-term ramifications on their home. Maybe some future chefs there, too. Well, I want to say something about the reef. I don't know if oyster is necessarily the answer. We could go look at the Rockaway Reef. The Rockaway mm -hmm. Reef is a man-made reef off of Far Rockaway. And basically, they dump trains, planes, and airplanes after the Second War. But it is also one of the most alive 
fishing areas that you could actually go on the South Shore of Long Island. You could, we could go out there right now, we could catch blackfish, sea bass, porgies, striped bass, many, many different species. You'll reel up a piece of the bottom and there'll be squid eggs all over something. There'll be, you know, there'll be oysters, there'll be different varieties of clams. So, you know, maybe the idea of having a reef is good, but the oyster may actually take too long and it's become kind of popular where they make these somewhat man-made reefs. Mm -hmm. And then you get the little bait fish show up and you get barnacles and you get mollusks and mussels and so on and so on. And it, you have a whole ecosystem. I want to talk about ecosystem because I know from reading your work, Mark, not just in terms of marine life, but in general, that, that New York once had one of the greatest ecosystems in not just in the country, in the world. Natural wonder. Can you describe that for our viewers? Because I think a lot of people would be surprised to know that. Yeah, I mean, you know, Manhattan was, you know, it was full of uh, uh, lynx and mountain lion and deer and elk and uh, wild fruit. And uh, the, the first Europeans to come, when they rounded Sandy Hook, they got into the harbor, they all described how there was this incredible sweet smell. Um, it, uh, Lilacs. <laughs> Florists, yes. <laughs> um, there, there were, you know, tremendous diversity, not only of fish and sea life, but mammals and land life and, and plant life and just a really rich play. I mean, this was uh, one of the great estuaries of the world. Now, I often think about that when I'm in that part of New Jersey across from Manhattan. Uh, you know, that's all wetlands there. You look out there and, you know, if you don't look at the industrial stuff and you look at the natural stuff, it's this incredible wetlands full of bird life. And you think, you know, by what act of lunacy was it decided that, you know, here was the place to build industry and to build, you know, a, a city? Well, it probably wasn't decided. It was probably just thoughtless and without right. any real thought or decision made, we just proceeded and now we look back and we've undone ourselves. And I guess the question is, can we ever get back to anything near to what we had, Pete? Well, I think we're already well on our way. I mean, for the now, um, for the first time, there's invertebrate larvae surviving in the, in the river. So we see barnacles, clams, mussels, teredo worms are eating the piers again. All these things are coming back. That's why um, we think oysters are, it's, it's time to restore the oysters because for the first time we're seeing oyster spat land on our reefs and land on, on structure around, around the harbor. So we feel like it's, it's ready. It's at, at a point where it can support the larvae. Yeah, I, mean, I, I also think it's important, I mean, what you're doing with the school, but also the reefs and all of this stuff, um, that uh, it, it does something psychological. It, it reminds New Yorkers of their history, and it reminds them that they're living in an estuary and that nature here is of value and that things can be restored. And, and, and I, think it's, uh, I, th I think it's a very positive thing uh, psychologically for New Yorkers. For all of us. And Dave, if we ever get back to a place where, where the ecosystem is such that we can eat locally, as you use that phrase, eat locally, eat the oysters, what, what's important to know about preparing them in order to get the best possible result? Well, I mean, you would have the best. It's coming, you know, right from your yard. I mean, you can't ask for much better than that, you know? I mean, if we'll, we will say we call it intrepid cove oysters, you know, the intrepid's right down the street from Eska, you know, at one point, maybe we will be taking oysters from that area over there again. You know, the water will be clean, you have a tidal flow, you have a lot of movement in the water, which is always important for the quality of these particular items. And, and you know, if you read Mark's book, the, the oyster carts used to be as ubiquitous as a hot dog stand. They were everywhere. Can you imagine that? That'd be great. That'd be cool. It would. <laughs> so so what, what can New Yorkers do? I guess I'll ask each of you this uh, in our individual ways to help clean up our, our harbors and our waters. I, I guess I'll start with you, Dave. Well, first people need to pick up after themselves. I mean, that's a start, you know. You can walk down the street and you see people throwing garbage and, you know, it rains that gets washed right into the Hudson River, the East River, it ends up in New York Harbor. Um, people need to be, you know, people need to be involved. I mean, out by where I live, they've restored a lot of the marshlands. They, 
we used to build all these bait, we called them bait houses. There were people had homes, but the state always owned the land. And as the homes fell down, the state told the people they couldn't rebuild them because they're gonna reclaim the marshlands. So, you know, the birds came back and, you know, in the spring this year, we had a tremendous population of grass shrimp in the bay, which is really important because it's the food line. Um, but people need to be involved and they have to say, you know, enough is enough. And be aware of what's happening be, in your Be aware. I mean, you know, look out your window. Would you, would you rather be able to canoe down the East River and enjoy it and, you know, say, wow, look how beautiful this is? Or go back to the way we were 15, 20 years ago where there was sludge on the top and, you, had, you know, needles washing up on your beaches and so on and so on. Yeah, terrific advice. Pete, what do you, what do you advise us to do as, as individual citizens? Well, in addition to what Mark was talking about, the heavy metals and the PCBs and the oysters, there's also runoff, but um, combined sewage overflows. Every time it rains a significant amount in New York City, the sewage treatment plants are inundated with wastewater and they're allowed to open their floodgates. So raw sewage pours into, the, pours into the harbor. This is a problem in most cities, but in New York there's so much pavement and so many people that it only takes a few tenths of an inch to get past that critical point. It happens roughly 60 days a year. Because you're consuming shellfish raw, that would shut down all your shellfish beds. How many gallons at a time are they pumping? Million, hundreds, of hundreds of millions, hundreds of millions. millions. Amazing. The system treats a billion gallons of wastewater on a dry day, and it's a trillion gallon system that's inundated on a wet day. So, I mean, you, the, the volume is, is incredible. Think about the volume of rain we've had since Absolutely. July. Absolutely. We've had more than the average amount of rainfall uh, in this past summer season. So that it, whatever the average is, uh, we can hit top over, we can overtop that number. Is there and I guess modernization our modernization of the well, system? There is, no. there is a modernization of the system, and the DEP has pledged over the next five years to spend $6.5 billion retrofitting some of the treatment plants, exactly. which should bring that number down 30%, the, amount, the volume that's going to the rivers. But New Yorkers can realize that whenever it's raining outside, whatever you flush down your toilet or if you're doing the laundry or running your dishwasher, that's just going right into the harbor. You need to be thinking. So think about it. If it's raining, don't do your, don't do your laundry. Yeah. Don't take a shower. Mark. Well, uh, a couple of things come to mind. One is plastic. You know, plastic is a big problem, not just for New York Harbor, but for all of the oceans. And uh, we need to be uh, more careful what we do with plastic. And uh, we need to use less plastic. Yes. You know, okay. if you recycle and you have your bin there for the plastic, it's unbelievable how quickly that fills up. You know, there's just so much plastic. You and, know, and we know only a small percentage of recyclable plastic actually ends up in those bins. Right, right. And, you know, I mean, buy beverages and glass bottles. Uh, just try to use less plastic. And, and the other thing I would say is um, encourage kids because we have this generation of kids coming up who are just kind of natural born environmentalists. They're, they're just very concerned. They, they, they know that things are messed up. They, they're eager to do things about it. And we can encourage them with, uh, you know, send them to school in Governor's Island or, you know, uh, make sure there's curriculums in their, in, in their schools about this stuff. They, they want to learn about it. Take them to places where, uh, you know, there are programs doing things. And, you know, we, we are well on our way to, uh, uh, raising a really environmentally conscious, I could even say militant, uh, generation. I think in a whole new way about the environment, and that's a good thing. I, I want to ask you each a, a fun question to wrap up. What's your favorite way to eat oysters? Mark, first to you. Raw. Favorite? Like they are. Raw. Natural. You guys are devotees of the <laughs> raw, natural oyster. Well, thanks to you all, Dave, Pete, Mark. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thank you. And that is our show. Join me next time for more compelling conversation on TED Talks in NYC. We leave you with what our other TED Show panelists said when we asked, what do you like to eat with your oysters? Thanks for watching. I'm Jamie Floyd. Tabasco sauce. Beer. Vodka. A martini. I don't eat oysters. I'm a vegetarian. A little bit of mignonette sauce on them or a squeeze of lemon, raw. You know, oysters are an aphrodisiac, right? Creme fraiche. I don't eat oysters. I don't like oysters. I'm allergic to oysters, so I never eat anything with them. I throw them up. <laughs> Fried oyster po' boy, number one. More <laughs> oysters. <laughs> I'm kind of addicted to them. My favorite thing with oysters is my fiance, Alan. We like to eat them together.